Hello, and welcome back to Storytime with Eric Zimmer. Where we last left off in Trumpet of the Swan, Lewis started going to school, where he started to learn to read and write, and of course, is a natural at it. But they say that, um, that a trumpeter swan finds his or her love by calling to her, trumpeting, so to speak. But since Lewis is mute, he can't do that with a voice. I think trouble is about to happen. We'll see what happens next. So you ready? All right, let's begin. Chapter eight, love. I knew it. <laughs> when Lewis's father and mother discovered that Lewis was missing, they felt awful. No other young swan had disappeared from the lakes. Only Lewis. The question now arises, said the cub to his wife, whether or not I should go and look for our son. I am disinclined to leave the ease attractive lakes now, in the fall of the year, with winter coming in. I have, in fact, been looking forward to this time of serenity and peace and the society of other waterfowl. I like the life here. Uh, but what about your son? There's another little matter to consider besides your personal comfort, said his wife. Ha <laughs> ha. Has it occurred to you that we have no idea which direction Lewis went when we left? You don't know where he went any more than I do. If you were to start look, start out looking for him, which way would you fly? Well, replied the cob, in m the last analysis, I believe I would go south. Obviously. What do you mean, in the last analysis, said the swan impatiently? You haven't analyzed anything. Why do you say in the last analysis? And why do you pick south as the way to go looking for Lewis? There are other directions. There's north and east and west. There's northeast, southwest, southwest, northwest. Truce, replied the cob. And the and there are all those in between directions. North, northeast, east, southeast, south, uh, northwest, west, southwest. There's north by east and east by north. There's south, southeast and ha half east, and there's west by north a half north. The directions a young swan could start off in are almost too numerous to think about. So it was decided that no search would be made. What? We'll just wait here and see what happens, said the cob. I feel sure Lewis will return in the fullness of time. <laughs> Months went by. Winter came to the Red Rock Lakes. The nights were long and dark and cold. The days were short and bright and cold. Sometimes the wind blew, but the swans and geese and ducks were safe and happy. The warm springs that fed the lakes kept the ice from covering them. There were always plenty. There were always open places. There was plenty of food. Sometimes a man would arrive with a bag of grain and spread the grain where the birds could get it. Spring followed winter. Summer followed spring. A year went by, and it was springtime again. Still no sign of Lewis. Then one morning, when Lewis's grown-up brothers were playing a game of water polo, one of them looked up and saw a swan approaching in the sky. Ah, uh, could it be him? Maybe. <laughs> Koho! cried the Singit. He rushed to his father and mother. Look! 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 At the waterfowl. All the waterfowl on the lake turned and gazed up at the approaching swan. The swan circled in the sky. It's Lewis, said the cob. But what is that particular little object hanging around his neck by a string? What is that? Wait and see, said his wife. Maybe it's a gift. Lewis looked down from the sky and spotted what looked like his family. When he was sure, he glided down and skidded to a stop. His mother rushed up and embraced him. His father arced his neck gracefully and raised his wings in greeting. Everyone shouted, Koho! and welcome back, Lewis. His family was overjoyed. He had been gone for a year and a half, almost eighteen months. 
I know what a year and a half is. He looked older and handsomer. His feathers were pure white now instead of a dirty gray. Hanging by a cord around his neck was a small slate. Attached to the slate by a piece of string was a white chalk pencil. When the family greens were over, Lewis seized the chalk in his bill and wrote, Hi there on the slate. He held the slate out eagerly for all to see. The cob stared at it. The mother swan stared at it. The singets stared, stared at it. They just stared and stared. Words on a slate meant nothing to them. They couldn't read. None of the members of his family had ever seen a slate before, or a piece of chalk. Lewis's attempt to greet his family was a failure. He felt as though he had wasted a year and a half by going to school and learning to write. He felt keenly disappointed, and of course he was unable to speak. The words on the slate were all he could offer by way of greeting. Finally, his father, the cob, spoke up. Lewis, my son, he began in his deep, resonant voice, this is the day we have long awaited, the day of your return to our sanctuary in the Red Rock Lakes. No one can imagine the extent of our joy or the depth of our emotion at seeing you again, you who have been absent from our midst for so long in lands we know not of. In pursuit we, so we can only guess at. How good it is to see your countenance again. We hope you have enjoyed good health during your long absence in lands we know not of, in pursuits we can only guess at. You've said that once already, said his wife. You're repeating yourself. Lewis must be tired after his trip, no matter where he's been or what he's been up to. Very true, said the cob, but I must prolong my welcoming remarks a bit longer, for my curiosity is around by that odd little object Lewis is wearing around his neck, and by the strange symbols he has placed upon it by rubbing that white thing up and down, and leaving those strange white tracings. Well, said Lewis's mother, we're all interested in it naturally, but Lewis can't explain it because he is defective and can't talk, so we'll just have to forget our curiosity for the moment and let Lewis... Take a bath and have dinner. Everyone agreed this was a good idea. Lewis swam to the shore, placed the slate in chalk his chalk pencil under a bush, and took a bath. When he was through, he dipped the end of one wing in the water and sorrowly rubbed out the words, Hi there. He, then he hung it, the slate around his neck again. It felt good to be home with his family. And his family had increased during the months he had spent with Sam Beaver at school. There were now six new Singets. Lewis's father and mother had spent the summer on a trip to Canada, and while there they had nested and hatched six little Signets, and in the fall they had all joined up again at the Red Rock Lakes in Montana. One day, soon after Lewis's return, the grain man stopped by with a sack of grain. Lewis saw him and swam over. The man, when the man spread the grain on the ground to feed the birds, Lewis took off his slate and wrote, Thank you very much. He held the slate up to the man, who appeared surprised. Say, said the man, you're quite a bird. Where did you learn to write? Lewis erased the slate and wrote, At school. School? said the grain man. What school? Public school, wrote Lewis. Mrs. Hammerbotham taught me. Never heard of her, said the grain man, but she must be a darned good teacher. She is, wrote Lewis. He was overjoyed uh, to be carrying on a conversation with a stranger. He realized that though the slate was no help with other birds, it was going to be a help with people because people could read. This made him feel a whole lot better. Sam Beaver had given Lewis the slate as a goodbye present when he left the ranch. Sam had brought the slate and the chalk pencil with money he had saved. Lewis decided he would always carry them with him, no matter where he went in the world. The grain man wondered whether he had been dreaming or whether he had really seen a swan write words on a slate. He decided to say nothing about it to anyone for fear people might think he was crazy in the head. Hmm. Probably good, a good idea. Hmm. For, for birds, spring is the time to find a mate. The warm, sweet airs of spring stir strange feelings in young swans. The males begin to notice the females. They show off in front of them. The females begin to notice the males too, 
but they pretend they are not in noticing anything at all. They act very coy. Lewis felt so queer one day, he knew he must be in love. And he knew which bird he was in love with. Whenever he swam past her, he could feel his heart beat faster, and his mind was full of thoughts of love and desire. He thought he had never seen such a beautiful young female swan. She was a trifle smaller than the others, and she seemed to have a more graceful neck and more attractive ways than any of his other friends on the lake. Her name was Serena. Beautiful name. He wished he could do something to attract her attention. He wanted to her for his mate, but was unable to tell her so because he couldn't make a sound. He swam in circles around her and pumped his neck up and down and made a great show of diving and staying down to prove he could hold his breath longer than any other bird. But the little female paid no attention to Lewis's antics. She pretended he didn't exist. Here's a picture of what she looks like. When Lewis's mother found out that Lewis was courting a young female, she hid behind some bulrushes and watched what was going on. She could tell that he was in love by the way he acted, and she saw that he was having no success. Once in desperation, Lewis swam up to Serena, his beloved, and made a bow. His slate, as usual, was around his neck. Taking the chalk pencil in his mouth, he wrote, I love you, on the slate, and showed it to her. She stared at it for a moment, and swam away. She didn't know how to read, and although she rather liked the looks of a young cub who had something hanging around his neck, she couldn't really get interested in a bird that was unable to say anything. A trumpeter swan that couldn't trumpet was a bust as far as she was concerned. When Lewis's mother saw this, she went to her husband, the cob. I have news for you, she said. Your son, Lewis, is in love, and the swan of his choice, the female of his desiring, pays no attention to him. It's just as I predicted. Lewis won't be able to get a mate because he has no voice. That snippety little female he's chasing after gives